head of the unit for strategies and multilateral global processes for development cooperation here at the ministry of foreign affairs and international cooperation of italy i would like to welcome you all here today in person and online for the reporting back by session moderators of the 2022 edition of the sdg 16 conference on people-centered governance in a post-pandemic world. And before I give the, the floor to the moderators, uh, since we're running a little bit late, may I kindly ask you to stick to the to five minutes, no longer than five minutes in your, in your remarks. It's now my pleasure to give the floor to Ms. Ilaria Bottigliero, IDLO's Director of Policy Research and Learning, who kindly facilitated the first session of this conference yesterday. Ms. Bottiglieri, could you please share the key messages from session one? The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so in session one, preventing conflict and sustaining peace in an increasingly fragile world, themes of inclusion, trust, ownership, social contract, food security and the links between justice and peace building at all levels resonated uh, across speakers' remarks. It was uh, emphasized that peace is not just the absence of conflict and there are many long-term implications of violence and insecurity that must be addressed through sustained support and engagement. Speakers noted that uh, women and youth are often the first responders to conflict and building peace, um, uh, and, and they are also simultaneously those who are the most affected by the impact of war. They are nevertheless seldom involved in decision-making and peace processes. The panel highlighted that women should be visible and engaged at every stage of peace building and prevention, and that women at the decision-making table and in the design of peace processes are absolutely key. Engaging young people in peace processes and investing in their capacities, including as leaders, would help rebuild their trust in governance. What is needed, uh, the panel noted, are concrete actions and policies, including in terms of employment and education opportunities. Supporting civil society, grassroots organizations, and community level peace building was also noted as critical, as were the links between promoting peace and dialogue at the local and subnational levels, in addition to national and international levels. To this end, uh, panelists suggested that national dialogues and reconciliation activities are uh, critical in building trust and inclusion as were fair and accountable institutions and having development plans and national strategies in place to build more peaceful societies. The panel also noted that the national authorities need to have policies in place as well as the capacity to implement them. And speakers highlighted the fundamental role of the rule of law and access to justice as enablers of equal access to public resources, anti-corruption, and accountability. Long-term peace and stability and sustainable development will not be achieved without access to justice and the rule of law, with a functioning judiciary key to both preventing and resolving conflict and building peace. Finally, the panel noted that uh, food security is fundamental to peace, and rule of law is key to food security. Noting that food security undermines development, educational outcomes and political stability, and it affects women, youth and vulnerable groups the most. Ultimately, we must renew and rebuild systems of democratic governance where people are reassured that they will have access to effective justice systems and have trust in their institutions. Links between security and development need to be more deeply and practically addressed with a focus on processes. In this regard, inclusivity has been seen as essential for peace and security, and SDG 16 provides the framework for this. 
finally, more adequate, predictable, and sustained funding is needed. And despite the fact that prevention is far more cost effective, the panel noted that much more is spent on the response to war and conflict, and this needs to change. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Bottigliero. I am now pleased to give the floor to Ms. Maria Francesca Spatolisano, Assistant Secretary General for Policy Coordination and Interagency Affairs at UNDESA, who kindly facilitated the second session of the conference yesterday. Ms. Spatolisano, could you please share the key message with your panel? The floor is yours. Thank you. It is my pleasure to share with you my takeaway from session two. Uh, grouped in eight messages, and I might need a little bit more time than allowed because we had a very fascinating, very lively uh, exchange. The topic was building institutional resilience and enhancing effectiveness, accountability, and responsiveness of institutions. So first message is the importance of public administration and public institutions. The pandemic has highlighted the importance of effective and efficient public administration, sound and responsive public institutions, and competent public servants. COVID-19 caught governments ill-equipped, even in the most developed countries. But it has also shown the capacity of governments and the public sector to innovate, even in the context of very limited fiscal space. Overall, there is a need to strengthen public institutions, including their physical, technical, and social infrastructure. And we need agile learning institutions and capable public servants. The role of digital government and digital technologies, including artificial intelligence, was mentioned in terms of improving digital uh, internal systems in the public administrations for the creation of new e-services. And hence, well-prepared workforce must be formed and hired. But in fact, technology in itself is not sufficient. Transforming public institutions requires more than digitizing existing processes. Such transformation requires political will and leadership, changes in mindsets and sound management of public resources. There is therefore also a need to support the weakest countries in this regard. A second key message was the centrality of principles of public governance. As one panelist said, the SDGs are voluntarily, voluntary, but SDG 16 is not optional, meaning uh, that many of its dimensions are already included in national constitutions and international instruments ratified by countries. The pandemic has highlighted the importance of principles of effective governance, including the ECOSOC principles of effective governance for sustainable development, such as sound policy making, intergenerational equity, leaving no one behind, fiscal and budget transparency and participation. And it has provided a new opportunity to discuss governance principles with more openness and recognition of their importance and more demand from countries. As it turned out, the countries affected by dysfunctional governance suffered most and reacted less effectively. A third message is coherent policy making. Coherent policy making and collaboration across the government have been key during the pandemic, as COVID-19 is an essentially weak problem, as one of the previous speakers uh, uh, said, dynamic in nature with no ready-made policy response. It was mentioned that lack of coordination at the center of government has been a key factor of the loss of trust in government. Whereas opportunity to improve collaboration across sectors and government levels, from national to subnational to local, down to the community level and the traditional authorities should be seized as a matter of fact. Conditions for effective collaboration for public service delivery include uh, leadership, transparency, 
accountability and effective two-way communication. Now, the fourth key message which came out of session two was the critical role, and not only session two, the critical role of participation and engagement. The role of participation and engagement in pandemic responses was mentioned by nearly all the speakers. We heard many examples of civil society stepping up and engaging in planning, foresight, policy making, and budgeting, transparency, and accountability initiatives, all of which contribute to increasing the resilience of public institutions. And it was suggested that action on SDG 16 should start from a localization perspective. Civil society needs to be included at the grassroots level. Inclusiveness is a central aspect of COVID-19 responses, but without that effective two-way communication I was mentioning, there is no trust and inclusiveness becomes an empty word. And then the fifth message is about transparency and accountability. Transparency and accountability are critical during emergencies. As one participant said, policies need to be out in the open and clear. There needs to be accountability for success and for failure with a clear way of measuring outcomes. It was indeed recommended that governments should show consistent commitment to fiscal standards, even in times of emergency. Civil society has played a key role in increasing the transparency during the pandemic. CSOs have monitored budget execution, advocated for fair fiscal responses and public services, and raised public awareness of corruption. Examples mentioned included citizens' budget tra trackers and real-time audits supported by civil society. Using transparency mechanism effectively requires dialogue between governments and citizens. And as one participant put it, transparency that is not used is useless. Sixth message was about anti-corruption. National responses to COVID-19 have implied increased the public investment as well as accelerated or derogatory processes to disburse, disburse public funds. This has increased the risk of misappropriation of public funds and the risks of low effectiveness and efficiency of public spending. Simplified procedures and processes put in place to accommodate the need to spend quickly need to be balanced with increased transparency and better oversight of public spending. Public procurement has required major attention during the pandemic. Illicit financial flows are enormous and dwarf other international financial flows in many countries. Harnessing these missing funds will be critical for implementing the SDGs. It was also mentioned that the UN Convention Against Corruption provides the basis to fight corruption based indeed on the rule of law. And there is a need to build the capacity of countries to implement the convention. The pandemic has also taught us that anti-corruption prevention and preparedness can save lives. It has shown the importance of investing in anti-corruption education and training. Seventh mm, is the inclusion and leaving no one behind, data collection, lessons sharing. All these uh, uh, topics have been highlighted uh, by the pandemic as very, very important, whether it is inclusion of gender or uh, uh, other uh, uh, groups in the society, for instance, in peace building processes. For data, we don't have enough data and therefore progressing on governance related data is important. Uh, practical advances have been made during the last 15 years for measuring different dimensions of SDG 16, and we should leverage those. It is important to establish a culture of reporting on national level, at the national level. 
It was also mentioned that more attention should be paid to the question of how to communicate data on SDG 16 as the associated narratives may be as or even more important than the data itself. And finally, of course, there were calls to share the lessons from the pandemic, including through peer learning among government, governments. This is critical in order to capitalize on successful innovations. Eighth and final key message is, couldn't be otherwise, about financing and capacity building. Action on SDG 16 needs more reliable, long-term and less siloed finance adapted to the different types of countries. Funding is especially needed to support CSOs at the grassroots level, which have played a key role, as I was saying before, in pandemic response and recovery, but continue to experience difficulties in accessing funding. The CSO suggested to create an SDG 16 plus fund to address these issues in their 2022 Rome declaration on SDG 16 plus. There were also calls for increased effort to build the capacity of professional staff in public administration, for instance, on the right to information, on participation, transparency and accountability but also the capacity of civil society organizations in the same areas. Finding ways to mobilize existing competencies in public administration and putting them at the disposal of other parts of public administration was mentioned as important for building lasting sustainable results for the people we serve. And that's all for session two. Thank you, Mr. Bencini. Thank you very much, Ms. Patolisano, for your thorough, very comprehensive remarks. And I will now give the floor again to Ms. Bottigliero, who will report back on behalf of the IDLO's director, Mr. Guariglia. We are keen to hear the main messages that emerged during session three. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, so for session three, um, a new vision for the rule of law to, to address global challenges as in other sessions, uh, speakers highlighted the extraordinarily challenging backdrop against which this discussion takes place. With increased rights violations, conflict and violence on the rise, corruption, amplified challenges to gender equality, and increase in GBV, uh, the need to promote human rights, as well as, of course, uh, climate change. A key challenge highlighted was actually the pushback against the very notion of the rule of law, both at the national and international levels. It was noted that the Secretary General's uh, landmark re report, Our Common Agenda, emphasizes that a new vision for the rule of law is a key element for the realization of all 17 SDGs. In addressing the questions before them, uh, speakers highlighted the following key points. Now, first of all, the need to take a more holistic approach to the rule of law, including looking at the nexus between the rule of law and a broader spectrum of peace and development issues. This includes, of course, putting people at the center of justice systems with a human rights approach, bringing justice closer to the people. The panel also discussed the need to rebuild trust and legitimacy in governance and public institutions. And here justice systems and the rule of law have a key role to play. The focus must be on service delivery, inclusivity, and for governments to take a more humble approach, it was mentioned. Inclusion and working with various stakeholders at all levels emerged as essential. Civil society and human rights and environmental rights defenders whose space and security is ever increasingly under threat was seen as problematic. Guaranteeing social protection was also seen as a fundamental aspect. Again, talking about the centrality of rule of law and people-centered approach, 
it was mentioned that this is essential to address transnational challenges from COVID-19 to climate change and the assault on biodiversity. The panel also discussed uh, the use of technology, including emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence. It was mentioned that while these play an important role, we must be careful to protect the principles of human rights, participatory decision-making, and avoiding a digital divide. Data from both official and unofficial sources can be used to bridge the gap between governments and people, improve communications, generate evidence-based solutions grounded in a clear understanding of people's legal needs, and help combat the narrative perceived or otherwise that justice is for the privileged only. Speakers also mentioned various tools and mechanisms in terms of finding solutions for the challenges that I just mentioned. Relevant frameworks, bodies and conventions such as UNCAC and the UN Convention on Transnational and Organized Crimes were mentioned, but also mechanisms such as legislative and technical <coughs> assistance, as well as compliance and enforcement mechanisms new statistical frameworks and partnerships to measure femicide so that victims are counted and justice can be served and prevention efforts can be more effective, but also partnership platforms with investors. Special mentions was made to co-created national action plans and participatory models of governance and to coalitions such as the Justice Action Coalition which are trying to mobilize support for the rule of law and SDG 16 at national and international levels. The panel uh, concluded that what we need is political will, inclusion, action, and determination, being able to tackle multiple crises at once. This would include greater inclusion of young people and indigenous communities, civil society, academia, from both the global north and south and media, but would also uh, require less fear and more solidarity and seizing opportunities for collective action. For example, bearing in mind the 2023 summit and global stock take. Uh, finally, a sustained financial commitment in justice and the rule of law was called for. So, in a nutshell, we have to push back and transform justice systems to renew social contract, deeper democracy, and accelerate implementation and deliver on the 2030 agenda. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Ms. Bottigliero. <clears throat> I am now pleased to give the floor to Luca Maestripieri, Director of the Italian Agency for Development Cooperation, who moderated the fourth session of this conference. Luca, you have the floor. Thank you, Leonardo. <clears throat> So the session four was dedicated to leaving no one behind, ensuring inclusion, protection, and participation. In this uh, very, very important session, we heard important lessons and policy implications for combating inequalities during the pandemic and beyond. We heard about progress and in policy innovation made during the past two years in strengthening social protection systems. We also heard about actions to combat inequalities and protect the rights of various social groups and persons in vulnerable situations. On inequality and poverty, there have been impressive efforts put, all, put by all governments in all regions to cushion the impacts of the crisis for the most vulnerable, even in difficult fiscal context. The range of measures adopted has been impressive. However, in many cases, there were short-term ad hoc responses, often leaving behind some vulnerable groups, for example, informal workers. In many countries, social registries were not up to date, social protection systems were not as developed as would have been needed, and many countries have taken off guard. More work is needed to address the root causes of poverty. It is important to accelerate the coverage of social protection systems and the development of social protection flaws. The financing gap remains formidable. 
People living in poverty were often forgotten by social protection responses, in particular because of lack of, of ability to overcome bureaucratic obstacles of various natures. Expenditures in social protection should not be seen as, as cost for government, rather it is an investment. It was mentioned that governments should put as much effort in ensuring that people claim their rights as they put in promoting vaccination. Universal social protection remains a distant objective. Today, there is a great risk of curtailment of those systems as the majority of countries are adopting austerity policies. This includes retargeting social protection measures, cutting the wages of civil servants, cuts in pensions for the elderly, and cuts in subsidies as labor flexibilization reforms. This goes against the spirit of the SDGs, which would call for more investment in these areas. There are, however, alternatives to these cuts, which governments can adopt. These include expanding progressive taxes, fighting illicit financial flaws, restructuring debt, reallocating public expenditures, and others. Decision-making on these issues need to be much more open. They should be decided through national dialogue and debates. On gender equality, the panel also discussed ways to mainstream and accelerate gender equality as a critical element of building back better after the pandemic. There is a need to take a gender element in all policies. Currently, gender trackers show that women are still underrepresented in COVID-19 task forces. We need gender responsive laws and institutions. Women are still missing in decision making. Member states and local authorities should implement ambitious temporary special measures, for example, gender quotas, to increase women's representation in institutions such as parliaments. But it was also mentioned that lack of access to justice for women and deterioration of human rights are a basic obstacle to the success of such measures. The need to repeal gender discriminatory laws is more urgent than ever. It is also critical to promote, enforce, and monitor equality and non-discrimination. Laws on domestic violence and sexual violence in the workplace need to be better enforced. Negative gender norms need to be addressed, including through justice sector reforms. And lastly, women need a place at the table in the peace building process. On refugees, the picture in terms of the rights of vulnerable people during the pandemic has been mixed with some innovations, but also regressions. Fundamental refugee rights have been fundamentally restricted during the pandemic, including the right to claim asylum. Civic reg registration has been an obstacle. Yet, many countries have been willing to take innovative approaches to using technologies and giving resident permits to refugees during the pandemic. As one panelist said, the key words in SDG 16 are inclusive societies. Inclusion means protection. Access to justice for the most vulnerable is key as our rights of access to healthcare. During the pandemic, many refugees had access to COVID-19 testing and treatment to refugees, but overall there remains barriers for refugees seeking healthcare. On LGBTQ+, the pandemic has had a disproportionate impact on LGBTQ people during the pandemic. The invisibility of the community has been an obstacle. It is, an impo it is important to build capacity of countries to better assess the relevant issues. There is a need to foster more dialogue, dialogue between the global north and global south on these issues. And it is also important to empower civil society working on LGBTQ questions, including by using the existing groups and mechanisms. There is also a need to involve the private sector, for instance, through national plans and business in human rights, which are rapidly expanding. And lastly, on critical role of participation and on youth engagement. Participation in its different dimensions, as mentioned in the targets of SDG 16, is fundamental. Yet the current conditions are challenging. For instance, freedom of, of expression remains highly contested, which hinders the capacity of people to express dissent and speak truth to power. 
This also creates an obstacle to partnerships with civil society. Much work remains to be done to better measure participation. We heard examples of how governments can better promote youth engagement in decision making. It is important to promote full participation and agency of youth in local, national, and international processes. The follow-up and review of the Sustainable Development Goals is one example. Youth have participated in national preparations of voluntary national reviews conducted by governments, sometimes with specific youth reports. In general, emerging innovations on technology, healthcare emanating from young people need to be fostered and supported. Thank you. Thank you, Luca. <clears throat> Last but not least, I'm now pleased to give the floor to Mr. Musa Sumana Soko, <coughs> founder of Youth Partnership for Peace and Development from Sierra Leone, who will report back from the civil society organizations meeting held yesterday morning. Mr. Musa Sumana Soko, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yesterday, we, as civil society organizations, launched and presented the 2022 Rome Civil Society Declaration on the SDG 16 plus. This declaration entitled SDG 16 plus imperial, an urgent call to action for safeguarding commitments to peaceful, just and inclusive societies was collectively drafted by civil society ahead of the 2016 conference. Earlier versions of this declaration in 2019 and 2021 received endorsement from over 270 organizations globally. This 2022 Rome Declaration comes at a critical moment. The declaration makes it clear that current geopolitical events have made the international community at a crossroad where the absence of urgent action and clear accelerated commitment towards SDG 16 plus will leave numerous people to suffer and countless others at risk been left further behind. Currently, government and international community are off track in implementation of the SDG 16 plus. And in many areas, progress is backsliding dramatically. In this 2022 Rome Civil Society Declaration on the SDG 16 plus, we have identified a number of key areas where amplified actions are needed to safeguard commitments from implementation and accountability for SDG 16 plus in the 2022 and beyond. The declaration calls for urgent action to protect civil society and expand civic spaces and respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms and connect SDG 16 plus with, other, with our common agenda. Provide capacity supports to propel greater action and implement, implementing SDG 16 plus via local support for accelerated action and advancing peace, justice, and inclusion. Overcome challenges and threats to multilateralism in promoting and preserving peace and security. Integrating integrated approaches and SDG 16 plus interlinkages with other SDGs and ensuring a human rights-based approach to recovery and resilience from, from the COVID-19 pandemic strengthening data, monitoring, and accountability for the SDG 16 plus. Mobilize and scale up commitments and investments around 2023 moments, SDG summit and summit for the future. Among some noteworthy recommendations and call to action included in the 2022 Rome Declaration, we call for establishment of a global SDG 16 plus fund to help ensure that grassroots organizations and groups have access to critical resources that are urgently needed. We call for an annual thematic review of the SDG 16 at the HLPF to ensure that SDG 16's role as a critical enabler for 2020, 2030 agenda is fully reflected and call upon governments to come to the 2023 SDG six SDGs summit with concrete and ambitious commitment to advancing the SDG 16 plus. First, with the wide range of once in a life, once in a generation challenges, 
emerging and worsening crisis have made it clear that SDG 16 plus is in peril and the risk of further, the risk of failure is as real as ever. We are calling on all stakeholders to increase their individual and collective efforts to implement SDG 16 plus and the 2030 agenda as a whole before it comes too late to fulfill commitment pledged in, the, in 2015. And we stand ready to partner in these efforts. We expect you as member states to come with new, meaningful, concrete and ambitious commitment and investment to accelerate progress on SDG 16 plus. The cost for inaction is huge and the opportunity to act is now. As civil society, we pledge to do our part. We urge you to do the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very many thanks to the, to the moderators for their remarks and to all the participants who have been following us. I will now invite Director General Fabio Cassisa to take over as moderator of the closing session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Leonardo. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the conclusion. Ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the conclusion of this edition of the SDG 16 conference. First of all, let me take this opportunity to thank Mrs. Patolisano, Assistant Secretary General at DESA, and Mrs. Beagle, Director General of IDLO, for their continued engagement, as well as all the moderators, the high level attendees, speakers, and delegates who joined us in our discussion. Their presence has been invaluable and without a doubt has helped make the event a great success. A special thank goes as well to all those involved in the organization for making the event possible in spite of the still precarious context. I believe that the conference has been particularly effective in fostering an honest, inclusive, and in-depth discussion on how people-centered governance can help rebuild trust in institutions, accelerate sustainable development processes, and address the challenges of the post-pandemic world. During these two days, many ideas, interpretations, facts and figures and visions have been shared and discussed. As we all know, the conclusion of this conference will feed into the 2022 High-Level Political Forum on Sustainable Development, next July in New York, where some of the SDGs hardest hit by the pandemic, such as SDG 4 on quality education and SDG 5 on gender equality, will be discussed. It has emerged how the consequences of the crisis have weighed and still weigh heavily on vulnerable groups, such as women, girls, young people, and people with disabilities. Different approaches based on data and experience to build and sustain development in conflict-affected context, counter growing polarization, and combat disinformation and misinformation have been fruitful discussed. Also, the degree to which the pandemic has exacerbated the tensions both between countries and within them has been deeply analyzed. What began as a violent shock has turned into prolonged stress for institutions with the devastating long-run effects regardless of the level of development of each country. In some cases, bringing public services near breaking point. Tangible examples of long-term problems were discussed during the conference with the aim of identifying the best strategies to promote the resilience and effectiveness of institutions in times of prolonged stress. The need for a new vision of the rule of law through which global challenges are faced has clearly emerged. 
focusing on people-centered justice based on evidence and a better understanding of the needs of those seeking it is essential to rebuild the social pact between the citizens and governments and to put the respect of the fundamental rights of people at the center. A renewed trust in institutions is more than ever needed and it represents the driver through which we will have to build back better after the pandemic. We also heard how governments, citizens, civil society and other actors have joined forces to design and implement effective and innovative practices to enhance governance during the pandemic. They provide invaluable lessons, not only for the next phase of the recovery, but also for building more resilient societies, addressing inequalities and vulnerabilities, supporting the decade of action and delivering sustainable development. On the issue of inclusiveness, our speakers have also mentioned the need for initiatives that encourage a stronger coordination between institutions and civil society, as well as within civil society, between associations themselves. While the pandemic has created the major challenges, it also provided an opportunity to rethink governance with the SDG 16 from a people-centered perspective as a central pillar and the lever for transformation. The transformative action that the health crisis is compelling governments to take, if rooted in multilateralism and global solidarity, can bring about renewed sustainable progress in achieving the 2030 agenda. Governance, institutional and policy innovation at the local, national, regional, and international levels can accelerate the implementation of SDG 16 and promote integrated whole of a society approaches needed to tackle complex interrelated challenges, such as uh, entrenched conflict, increased inequalities, social and economic insecurity, climate change, and rapid technological disruption. Finally, the issue of institutional accountability was discussed. Our speakers have not only highlighted the need to ensure that the resilience mechanisms are not flawed by corruption, but also expressed a general and heartfelt need of actively promoting among the people the culture of transparency, accountability, and the rule of law. Ladies and gentlemen, a peaceful, just, and inclusive recovery will be possible only through transparent and accountable institutions that can guarantee the rule of law, good governance, human rights, gender equality, and environmental sustainability. I believe that a continued exchange between member states, independent authorities, the judiciary, multilateral partners, civil society, and all the relevant actors is crucial to build back better and leaving no one behind. As the G16's implementation require collective, coordinated, and continued efforts. Let's increase, intensify, and elevate our action towards a full SDG 16 implementation. Thank you very much. Sorry, thank you very much. I give the floor to Mrs. Patolisano for her conclusions. Excellencies, uh, Mr. Fabio Cassese, the Director General for Development Cooperation, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation of Italy, the Director General of International Development Law Organization, Ms. Jan Beagle, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, we have reached the end of the SDG 16 Conference 2022 on people-centered governance in a post-pandemic world. 
This has been a very engaging and rich event with participants joining online from different continents and many of us have managed to come to the beautiful city of Rome. And I thank all speakers and participants for their insights and contributions to the discussions and deliberations. I would like to extend my gratitude to the government of Italy for hosting the conference here for the second time. And I would like to thank the International Development Law Organization for partnering again with the United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs in the organization of this event. I would like to acknowledge the participation of civil society during these two days and their work to update the Rome Civil Society Declaration on SDG 16. Engaging with all the SDG 16 plus stakeholders is key to any meeting that looks at ways forward on the issues that the conference has examined. And I am glad that the hybrid format allowed us to do so this year. We just heard several important messages that resonated through the past two days, and I will not repeat them. For those of you who followed the previous editions, of the conference, it must be clear that there is continuity in what we heard. This should not come as a surprise. The challenges facing peace, justice, and inclusive societies have not gone away. Many of the messages included in the outcome of last year's conference remain fully relevant, and not least because the pandemic globally is still with us. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to leave you with a few thoughts that were triggered by the various interventions. I have only four points to make. First, the four dimensions that the conference has examined, peace, the rule of law, robust institutions, and leaving no one behind are not disjointed. On the contrary, the examples we heard throughout these two days have shown how challenges in one of those areas can quickly spill over to the other three others. For instance, the existing of conflict makes leaving no one behind more difficult to achieve. Gaps in the rule of law foster corruption. Lack of access to justice directly results in leaving all parts of society behind. This interconnectedness was made very clear thanks to the multidisciplinary backgrounds of the speakers. So while promising avenues have to be pursued in each of these areas, a holistic perspective is needed at all times to ensure that the other areas are kept in sight. This in itself is a formidable challenge for international and national institutional institutions alike. The second point, in spite of all the innovations that have taken place over the world to allow critical sectors such as health and education to continue to function during the pandemic, we should not be complacent. Millions of children and students were not able to access quality education in spite of digital solutions. In some countries, health systems have been pressured to the breaking point. Gender equality and women's empowerment have suffered setbacks. We should not look at these and other negative impacts of the pandemic as short-term problems in need of a fix. They have fundamentally altered the development trajectory of many countries and will be felt for years, perhaps decades, we are looking at a different world and have to adjust to this new reality. Similarly, we should be worried that while we all recognize the importance, of course, of relying on evidence and data, enhancing coordination across government agencies, increasing preparedness of public institutions for crisis, and communicating appropriately with the public in times of emergencies, the record of countries' responses to the pandemic has been mixed. So calling for more of the same will not suffice. 
Third, it seems clear that solutions to institutional challenges at the national level have to be attuned to rapidly changing national context. For instance, countries that were seen as examples to follow based on their response to the first wave of COVID-19 have sometimes struggled to contain later waves. Rapid changes in society's tolerance for constraint, trust in their government, and level of hardship felt by the people, among many other factors, may have rendered responses strategies less effective over time. Such evolution are highly context specific, and this should be a call for humility and prudence for all of us. Fourth, the theme of engagement with non-governmental actors in responses to COVID-19 was recurrent. We heard about the importance of engaging civil society, specific groups of the population, women and girls, the youth, in efforts to sustain peace, increase transparency and accountability, and to make societies more inclusive. And this is undoubtedly an area where much has been learned during the past two years and where many innovations can be transferred to the next normal. To conclude, let me state again that SDG 16 in all its dimensions is a fundamental underpinning of sustainable development. It will be instrumental to efforts by all stakeholders to shape post-pandemic strategies and policies while recovering the ground lost on other SDGs and to deliver on the 2030 agenda. I'm looking forward to the outcome of this conference informing the high-level political forum on sustainable development in July this year in New York. Beyond this, I hope that the discussions at the conference will have provided food for thought to all of you and that you will be able to translate them into concrete policies and actions at all relevant levels back home. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Patolisano, and thanks to the Department of Economic and Social Affairs for the contribution, valuable contribution given to this conference and for your remarks and comments. Thank you. I, now I am pleased to give the floor to Ms. Jean Beagle, Director General of the International Development Law Organization, which co-organized this conference along with the UN DESA and Italy. Uh, IDLO has kindly facilitated the, the first and the third session of this conference. Uh, Ms. Beagle, we would greatly appreciate your thoughts as to the main messages that you see we should project on the important topics that have been addressed at this conference. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Director General Cassise and Assistant Secretary General Spatolisano, uh, colleagues and friends. It, it is a pleasure to join you again uh, as we come to the end of the conference and it has been a fascinating two days. Uh, I would like to share two key takeaways uh, from my perspective. The first is one of urgency because the picture that has emerged from the discussions over these last two days has been a grim one in many ways. The consensus from last year's conference was that while COVID-19 posed formidable challenges to peace and sustainable development, it also presented a chance to break from the inequalities and injustices of the past. We agreed at that time that the world was at a crossroads and that we faced fundamental choices about the type of future we wanted to build. Unfortunately, we only have to look around us to see that the better angels of our nature seem to be losing out. The impact of the pandemic has been devastating, deepening inequalities, exacerbating fragilities, and exposing major trust deficits in governance. Today on Earth Day, we are reminded that climate change if left unaddressed, represents an existential threat. 
and conflict and humanitarian crises are affecting more people than ever before, with women and girls bearing the brunt of their impact. There is insufficient investment in prevention and in addressing the root causes of poverty, inequality, and discrimination. So in the words of the Secretary General, and I quote, we are at the edge of an abyss and headed in the wrong direction. So we have both, I believe, a moral duty, uh, but also an overwhelming self-interest uh, to reverse these trends. And there were some encouraging glimmers of hope uh, emerging over these last two days. So my second message is one of cautious optimism. Around the world, we see coalitions of governments, international organizations and civil society rallying together, uh, determined to break the nexus between insecurity, injustice and poor governance. And we heard from many of them uh, at this conference. Uh, the governments have shared innovative approaches to crisis response and recovery. Multilateral institutions have highlighted frameworks to prevent conflict and sustain peace, to combat corruption and to address inequalities. And civil society have showcased good practices at the community level from resolving disputes to ensuring the integrity of public information. The renewed Rome Declaration by members of civil society contains many timely messages and will be a key refer reference point for all of us. Young leaders demonstrated the importance of empowering youth networks and ensuring their meaningful participation in policy making and implementation. It is this energy, enthusiasm and innovation that we must carry forward. And as we have heard, we need to reflect more on how we can ensure more effective engagement of young people in our work. And I will certainly um, be thinking about that uh, in IDLO. Uh, I would like to conclude uh, on a note of gratitude. I want to thank all of you for taking the time to discuss these critical issues. My thanks to all the distinguished speakers and the participants joining in Rome and around the world online. I would like to express my deep appreciation to our host, uh, the Government of Italy, and to the Department of Economic and Social Affairs for their continued partnership with IDLO and for their support for SDG 16. Colleagues, uh, IDLO is proud to join you as part of this growing movement for transformation. We encourage governments to prioritize expenditures related to the rule of law in their national plans and budgets, to promote more participatory decision-making and to strengthen the capacity of public institutions. We encourage international development partners to increase assistance for nationally-led human rights-based and people-centered reforms and to increase financing for the rule of law. The Justice Action Coalition is one such initiative that IDLO is, pleased, is very pleased to support. We appreciate the private sector's strong endorsement of the SDGs and encourage them to back their rhetoric with concrete action to eliminate illicit financial flows, prevent corruption, and promote inclusive economic development. To achieve the peaceful, just, and inclusive societies envisaged by SDG 16, we must act now and together to invest in people-centered approaches to governance and the rule of law that leave no one behind. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Beagle. Thank you to the IDLO for the cooperation for, this, uh, for the organization of this conference. I think that the partnership between uh, Italy, this uh, and IDLO is very effective, and we will continue putting uh, SDG 16 at the center of our activities and programs. So, to conclude, very, very many thanks to the speakers and to all the participants who have been following us in person and online for these two days. 
we look forward to seeing you at the next edition of this series of SDGs conference. Let's hope next year we will continue our dialogue and our discussions. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you.